A very good evening to you all and welcome to News Tonight this Thursday, the ninth day of January 2020. First of all, let's have a look at our top stories. In our headlines tonight, President Yuri Museveni to build a culture of walking as a therapy for physical fitness. KCD Fair Council meeting flops of absence of technical team. Turkey and Russia call for ceasefire, that is according to the Libya conflict. And in sports, Ethiopian women team arrives for Saturday game that is in the under-17 war. Hello there and welcome once again. We are coming live to you on air and online from Broadcast House here on Nal Avenue in Sign Language. It is Mughal Mohammed and I am Edward Rukidi Kijanangoma. President Yuri Kogutam Seveni has congratulated the Africa Kwetu on trek for the endurance exhibited in the 195 kilometer 2020 Garamba Virembo walk. He appealed to them to persevere and trek the remaining 14 kilometer journey from Kasambia camp in Kakumiro district to Virembo in Kivale district in Bunyoro subregion. Now the president was addressing trekkers and Bugangezi communities at the flag of point at Kasambia sub county headquarters, the second last campsite of the great trek to Virembo. This report courtesy of the presidential press unit. <laughs> As the great trek was coming to an end, President Joram Seveni congratulated the Africa Kwetu trekkers for the endurance they have exhibited in the 195 kilometers 2020 Garamba Birembo walk. The trekkers were about to embark on the 14 kilometer journey from Kasambia camp in Kakumiro district to Birembo in Chivali district, Bunyoro subregion. The, I congratulate you for covering most of the distance. <coughs> Since we have to combine walking with mobilization, we have to change the plan. Instead of just walking, walking, we cannot, we cannot walk and pass by the people and, and we say that we are walking. So we are only walking symbolically in some few sections. Like uh, we walked from uh, Garamba to Jomba, that was 20 point, some, point something kilometers. Then we, dro we drove to Katira, and then we walked from Katira to Chirema. I'm told that was 7 point something kilometers. Then we had to drive to Kagogo and from Kagogo we walked from uh, the technical school which is uh, a therapy. The president addressed trekkers and Bugangai's communities at the flag of point at Kasambia sub-county headquarters, the second last campsite of the great trek to Virembo. He also used the occasion to appeal to the people of Uganda to persevere and consolidate ideology in order to have a clear aim and the way forward for Africa. He, however, emphasized that one must have discipline to fight for ideology. He warned the trekkers against living unscrupulous lifestyles like alcohol consumption, among others. He thanked Buganga's MP County. Honorable Kassirivo at Woki for mobilizing the people of the area to join the trekkers on the final leg to be rainbow campsite. He called for the establishment of health tourism sites in Bukomero, Kanzida, Ndida Weru and Mutologo hilltops as well as in Kanyogoga purposely for walking exercise in order to help them get rid of unnecessary body fats. Fortunately this is not very difficult, it is not hilly. Because this walking really is good for, for, for health. Yes. When you sit in, the, in those offices of, of ours, you die slowly. The muscles are not working, the what? You, you think you are, you are clever, but actually you are not clever. <laughs> uh. So, I, I want to encourage the culture of, of physical 
Yes, it is to remember. It is to mobilize, and you have seen how we have, we have linked up, especially myself, to link up with those widows of mine, and I will come back and, and meet them, the widow of Setuba, the widow of Chisitu, the widow of Reverend Wamara, all those widows who, was, who find me, find me on the way, and they were there. Along the 14-kilometer trek from Kasambia campsite, the president stopped at Chirundi Birembo Trading Center, Chibuijana and Virembo to interact with Wanainchi. UBC TV, Harriet Nambi. <laughs> Thanks, Harriet, for that report there. Meanwhile, UBC crew has been following and covering the Africa Quay to 195-kilometer trek. Today, the team quoted President Yuri Seveni emphasizing ideology, discipline, and fitness, and how they move the country forward. Philip Aguta now reports. Hundreds of trekkers were excited as the week-long Africa Quay to trek that started from Garamba in Wakiso to Kakumiro district came to an end. The last day's trek on Thursday started in Kasambia sub-county to Birembo, Kakumiro district. It is the last day of the trek and it is not an easy task to complete more than 80 kilometers. The trekkers have to make stopovers to energize themselves. I've also grabbed a bottle of water. The recitation of liberation songs in combination with the Bonyoro cultural songs gave the trekking momentum. <laughs> Several stopovers were made along the route to Berembo with President Museveni re-emphasizing the campaign to increase household income. <laughs> President Museveni earlier encouraged Ugandans to embrace fitness campaigns to keep healthy. Because this walking really is good for, for, for health. When you sit in, the, in, in those offices of, your, of ours, you die slowly. The muscles are not working, the what? You, you think you are, you are clever, but actually you are not clever. Uh, so, I, I want to encourage the culture of, of physical. Mr. Museveni says that children of the fallen soldiers will manage a health fitness club to be established on NRA battlegrounds of Botorogo, Kagogo and Katera Hills. Secondly, the discipline to fight for it. Because if you have the aim, but you don't have the discipline to keep your, you, yourself fit to fight, then what will you do? For me, I, I'm ready to fight even today. If you start problems... Some of the trekkers share their experience on the one-week trek. It has been a great experience uh, as young people to be given this kind of chance to, to also sacrifice a little bit of what the revolutionists did. And uh, the knowledge you have picked, the resilience you have picked, I think we shall be able to, to keep the revolution legacy to also continue the legacy of Museum 7 because we have really seen his feet. Uh, the challenge I've got in this trek was only one. The chief trekker was so fast, being very aged. I was so challenged that at, at some moment I failed to catch up with him and I had to stay behind. The arrival of the trekkers here, as you can see, marks the climax of the one-week trek that started in Wakiso and the ending here in Kakumiro district. I am told most of the sites have been historical in NRA struggle, including Birembo, where many soldiers were feared to be dead, both government and NRA, including President Museveni, surviving an attack.
for UBC TV News. I am Philip Waguta in Birembo, Kakumiro District. Thanks, Aguta, for that report there. And we do hope that when you come back, you'll be fitter than the day you left for that trek. The Vice President, Edward Chionuka II, has commended Ugandans living in the diaspora for investing in various enterprises and inviting other professionals to engage in public-private investment partnerships. He was meeting a delegation of Canadian-born Ugandans led by Uganda's ambassador to Canada, Ruth Cheng, at his office. The Vice President, Edward Chonuka Sekandi, has commended the efforts of Ugandans living in the diaspora for loving their motherland and country of origin by investing in various enterprises back home as well as wooing other professionals and business entities to come and engage in public-private investment partnerships. While meeting a delegation of Canadian-born Ugandans professionals who were led by the Uganda's ambassador to Canada, Ruth Acheng, the vice president held those in the diaspora for exhibiting both patriotism and nationalism for plowing back their earnings which greatly contribute both to foreign direct investments and economic development. The vice president held Ambassador Ruth Cheng for visiting a number of wineries in Canada and copying their expertise which is now using to start SMEs for women across the country to start own wineries and boost their welfare. The Vice President said that unlike countries in the West, Uganda boasts of a number of fruits that can make both juice, concentrates and wines as well as having two natural planting seasons. Vice President Sekandi commended the Ambassador and the Canadian Diaspora for organizing last year's Uganda-Canada Trade Expo which has started bringing positive results. Ambassador Ruth Chen said that Canada has a number of Canadian-born Ugandans who are influential positions and whose skills can benefit the country. She introduced Dr. Lawrence Muganga, a Canadian-born Ugandan, to the Vice President, who is an education consultant and beneficiary of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Education Innovation Award of $1 million US dollars to revamp the education sector in Africa, of which Uganda is slated to be the first trial country. The meeting was attended by the Deputy Principal Private Secretary to the Vice President, Vincent Chiamwes Musubile. Reporting for UBC TV News, Stephen Kanakulia, Sempa. Now the first KCCA Council meeting has flopped after technical team failing to turn up and lack of quorum. Now this situation affects service delivery in Kampala City according to the elected political leadership. The acting deputy executive director KCCA Sam Serunkuma says technical team not attending council meeting does not affect service delivery at all as we hear in this report. The morale of councillors to discuss issues in the first council meeting was low as the technical team failed to turn up, including the necessary equipment and support for its smooth running. The discussion that was adjourned to another day went on without clerks and speakers, plus the meeting lacking quorum for councillors. The Lord Mayor, Elias Lukwago, however, read the letter he had written to the new minister for Kampala before council. Accordingly, he is still chairing these meetings because the KCCA law has not yet been gazetted. I believe we take full cognizance of the endemic and multidimensional challenges that have the death of the institution of KCCA and the governance of administration of the city for a very long time. There are very many unfinished businesses, like donor channels. You, know, you came to know about yesterday. People, six people were buried in uh, in Kansanga because of building which collapsed on them. So we would have uh, we would have expected to have the director fiscal plan to come here and give us a report about that. Some councillors attribute the boycott by a technical team to the task they were given to ensure that they make the position of the executive director right. We urge the ED to go and ensure that this is regularized by both the public service and the appointing authority. And apparently it seems this has not been done. Uh, now, uh, as a backlash to that inquiry that we made, the technical team seems to have to be shunning the authority meetings. Kangati guno gwe mutwe. Executive director bano ba director bano ba reporting akuye. Kangati wo bo mugobye bano ani agenda ku representing ani go buze bibuzo. Engineer Andrew Stakas term 
as acting executive director expired. Accordingly, this behavior by technical team derails service delivery. But you see, this has an effect of uh, affecting provision of social services. Because as authority, we are supposed to be determining the, 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 not only the policies, but also service delivery standards to the, to the city. As the year starts, there are a number of issues which include people dying in drainage channels and now buildings collapsing. These incidences require council meeting to demand a report from the physical planning department, but the meetings have failed to kick off. I'm Navka Farida and Gloria Guitabinchi in Kampala. Chadondo East Member of Parliament Robert Chagulanyi is to reschedule his countrywide consultation meetings. And this follows a meeting between the Electoral Commission, Police and People Power at the Electoral Commission headquarters here in Kampala. People Power Pressure Group leader Robert Chagulani sent a more hastan to the Electoral Commission seeking for an explanation why police has always been obstructing his scheduled consultations. Chagulani also Chadondo East legislator wants to solicit people's views on his intended bid to stand for the 2021 presidential elections. In the early hours of the day, police deployed heavily at the Electoral Commission premises ahead of the meeting. Chagulani was invited by the Electoral Commission to discuss the consultation saga. <laughs> It was a closed door meeting with the Electoral Commission officials and police as Chagulani sought an explanation from the electoral body why police was cancelling all his meetings despite having been cleared before. At a press briefing shortly after Chagulani told journalists that he is going to reschedule the meetings. Um, the police admitted to their wrongdoing and their illegal activities. We decided um, that we are going to reschedule the program for our consultations, write to the Electoral Commission once more, and also write to the police. And so far the main concern he raised to the Commission was writing to police and never getting feedback. We write to them, they should for starters acknowledge receipts of... In a phone interview with Kampala Metropolitan Police spokesperson Patrick Onyang, said police and people power have agreed on the guidelines. We agreed on most of the things we... No procession, the view of Early this week, MP Robert Chagulani's consultation meetings were all blocked by police, starting with Chadondo East constituency, Gulu and Lira with all the monies paid for the venues allegedly refunded. Shaidat Nasaku and Lydia Chomukama reporting for UBC. Still talking about uh, opposition politics, the Democratic Party, uh, DP, is to launch a no-violence campaign to preach peace ahead of the 2021 general elections. Now the party president general, Nobat Mao, says analysts have predicted violent acts during the election period and it's upon political parties to sensitize Ugandans not to, incur, to engage in violence. As DP, we are going to launch a no-violence campaign. All of us can be violent. There is no creature in the world that God did not equip with means of self-defense. Others have horns to pierce their enemies. Others have sharp claws. Others have teeth. Others have poison. Others God gave them speed to take off and flee from their enemies. So none of us is helpless. We will all perish if everybody becomes violent. So we are going to launch a no-violence campaign as the Democratic Party. We will give you the details. Already analysts are fearing that 2021 is going to be the most violent election season ever. I think DP has the moral authority to preach non-violence because we have proved that we are non-violent.
Welcome back. Let's continue with our news now. The Kampala Capital City Authority has blamed site engineers of the collapsed UK mall for not following guidelines. Now, it follows the collapse of the structure which killed six and injured eight workers on site yesterday. Construction at UK Mall in Kansanga has been compromised by the site engineers whom KCC blames for not following approved guidelines. Yesterday, UK Mall collapsed, killing six porters and injuring eight of others. The deputy acting director of KCC, Sam Selunkuma, says the engineer has shunned authorized instructions. So people don't take the instructions. And our staff normally go to the police to cross check. They cannot say that all sites, because of the numbers, there are many sites which are in place in the city. So our teams go on inspecting. When they leave, they contractize. It's a downplayed construction at night, which puts life of porters in danger. We continue to inspect and give guidance to the instructors as we are going. And I think we need to put in clauses in the law, which can penalize those people who don't follow the guidance as they are. The authority has stopped any further constructions until investigations are complete. Andrew Sebira compiled this report. Now, Parliament is to debate and find a lasting solution to the water flooding challenge in Wulambuli that still keeps residents of Nabongo sub-county sleepless. The Chairperson Parliamentary Committee on Natural Resources, Kefa Chionuka, underscores the need to mitigate activities of stone mining cement factories in the area. The concern comes in the wake of continuous stone mining despite a recent directive by the committee stopping such activities. When the Parliamentary Committee on Natural Resources visited the Elgon region of Eastern Uganda in November 2019, this is what they found. Houses were flooded, latrines were destroyed, and roads were impassable. A blame which residents of Nabongo sub-county put on stone quarrying activities by cement factories. I was requesting we put a bigger channel on the border since it will be no man's land to connect water which you have which will have dropped in the channel to direct to the normal natural body, so, uh, body sources like CP and the other side is Muyembe so that it doesn't continue continuously flowing to the lower lands like where we are. Such is what prompted the Kefakiwan Kaled Committee to issue this indefinite directive, stopping any stone mining. Does the Flavia Tololo cement factory, Tololo cement factory, Hima cement factory, Ne Kampala cement factory, Tubala Gira, Ngaka Chika Ka Parliament, Nti Baso Keba Imirizeko, Biova Deba Kolabiona. However, reports coming from the area indicates no signs of any merit to make for the residents. The only problem is that there are some companies we thought were also involved which are not involved and that is something which has to be isolated so that we are clear on the companies that actually should stop the mining activities until the situation is resolved. The earlier directive may still stand but not to the fullest. There is still need for verification of cement factories currently mining stones in the area. This is why the Minister of Energy is coming on board with the recently appointed portfolio holder, Mary Goretti Kitotu, promising to find a lasting remedy. They are liaising with the Minister of Energy and the Mineral Development on that. They've done the inspections which, uh, which is something fresh, which we are still now trying to go through. And uh, after we've gone through all this, we'll also be making a recommendation to the House and then bringing their attention to the activities that are going on without proper regulation. We heard about those complaints, but that was at a time when we were already again reshuffled. So me, I left that report in the Ministry of Environment and my colleague I think will have to pick it up but also from the mineral side 
we are going to take it up to ensure that those who are quarrying should ensure that they don't destroy or the kind of flooding which is being caused. They should be able to at least use the techniques which don't make the areas surrounding flood. An environment impact assessment conducted by Captura District Local Government recommended issuance of certificates for such operations in the area. It now remains to be seen which position Parliament will take when the House resumes next week. Henry Okrut, UBC. Thanks, Henry, for that report there. Now, Rotary International and Makerere University have signed a memorandum of understanding and launched a Rotary Peace Center. This was at Makerere University, where it also involved delegates from different parts of the world. The Vice Chancellor of Makerere University, Professor Banabas Nawangwe, has applauded the Rotary International for launching a center for peace at Makerere University because they have had conflicts at the university. Nawangwe also revealed that the center will help the country in promoting peace. OU is between the Rotary Peace Centers and Makerere University. And I'm sure that the peace center is going to put in place all the necessary efforts to produce those peace builders that will ensure that such conflicts don't arise again. Olayinka Babalolo, the Vice President of Rotary International, pledged support to Makere University in training people from different countries on peace talking. Be used for peaceful purposes, it can also be used for generating conflicts. And we are hoping that this program will help people come to the realization on how to peacefully deploy some of these technologies and the other things that, that, that you have talked about. During the launch, the stakeholders say that this is the first peace center in Africa and thanked that the Rotarian for their extensive contribution to the university. I congratulate the university management and Rotary International on this historic achievement. It's now our opportunity. We have the center here. The work starts now. This story has been compiled by Kenneth Tanaba for UBC News. Wakiso district environmentalists are having limited resources to protect vital features from encroachers. Rebecca Sabaganzi, the Wakiso district natural resource officer, says the nine million given to the whole district is not enough plus inadequate staff. Environment issues raised by the leaders in Wakiso district include untouchable encroachers, pollution of water bodies, and decline in agricultural produce, as well as affected fishing activities. Indeed, it disturbs us a lot. We carry on enforcements. We decide as leaders that let's move out to the, uh, to the field to do some monitoring. You find that as you call on the security, as you call on the environment police, everyone will be fearing orders from above. What kind of orders of, uh, uh, above that cannot enable Ugandans to live freely, that cannot enable people to appreciate once again Mother Africa, that cannot uh, allow people to know that this is what we are supposed to do. There is a gap and there is still a problem which we feel that at times the center, leave alone local government, the center is not doing. Rebecca Sabagans, the Wakiso District Natural Resource Officer, wants the government to increase on the district resources towards environment protection. The empowerment of environment police to deal with the disastrous human activities on the environment is raised as a necessity in Wakiso. As a district, I get like 9 million as a grant from the Minister of Water and Environment. And this grant is supposed to specifically be tagged to environment activities. It is from that that we share with the environment, it is from that that we share with forestry, so that we work in a combined effort. But definitely it is not sufficient. We need more staff, we need more vehicles, and we need a, a manageable security force that we can work with. This policy dialogue by Makara University through Environment for Development Center provides research about the environment related protection policies to implementers. At that local level, they are charged with an oversight role over the different natural resource 
uh, you know, uh, 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 sources, natural of looking after the different uh, wetlands, they're in charge of looking after the lake, they're in charge of, you know, constructing roads, and some roads have been constructed through the wetland. And so, for us as researchers, we have solutions. The road is needed for the economy to grow. But how can we construct a road that is also, uh, uh, you know, uh, respecting the existence of uh, that natural resource? Urbanization and population growth of 4.9% annually in Wakiso district have exerted pressure on the environment. Abdul Nasir Luwama for UBC News. News tonight will now take a short break, but we'll return with what's happening in the world of business. Stay with us. Hi, I'm DJ Drogba. On average, almost 250,000 people die on the road in Africa each year. As a proud African, this breaks my heart knowing that so many deaths could have been avoided. So when you're on the road, follow these safe steps and help save lives. Make sure you stick to speed limits. They're there to protect you and others. Slow down at high risk areas like junctions, sharp turns, and before traffic lights. And watch out for pedestrians, cyclists, and animals. To avoid collisions, keep a safe distance. And remember the three second rule. Pick out an object and count to three. If you pass the object before the count of three, you're far too close. So when you're on the road, follow these safe steps and help save lives. We all have a role to play in road safety. Together, let's make Africa's road safer. business now and Kampala Capital City Authority is due to start using smart parking technology to manage parking and further reduce traffic jam in the city while launching the program to roll out this technology at City Hall in Kampala the acting deputy executive director KCCA Sam Serunkuma has said it will help increase revenue through collections from parking Parking slots in Kampala are limited given the small space, increasing number of vehicles and population. The persistent traffic jam is being attributed to vehicles that spend time on the roads looking for parking slots. While carrying out a feasibility study on smart parking in Kampala, World Smart and Sustainable Cities Wigo from Korea discovered that street parking is a problem in Kampala. The pilot technology will be implemented at City Hall parking lot before rolling out. This system uses CCTV intelligence and provides statistics of how many cars park each day, calculate parking time and identify available parking spaces. The system will calculate, okay, this car has uh, been parked over here for one hour and it hasn't uh, paid anything and it's left. So the system sends that uh, back to KCC officials who decide, okay, this is the car that um, committed a crime, it didn't pay for its parking and it sends the owner of the car the violation ticket you have to pay and on that violation ticket ticket there will be a picture with the vehicle with the mob, with the vehicle number so the owner actually cannot deny that it was him after the pilot we go plan to propose a short-term scaling project which focuses on on street parking currently street parking is managed by multiplex according to KCCA owners of vehicles will get short routes to parking spaces through their mobile phones but smart parking can result in two 222,000 gallons of fuel saving 
by 2, 2030. And approximately 300,000 gallons of fuel saved by 2050. A World Bank report shows that Uganda loses 2.8 trillion shillings at peak hour in Kampala traffic jam. I'm Navka Farida and Gloria Gwitabinji reporting in Kampala. By KCCA and we hope it really uh, picks up. Now the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries has registered an increase in milk production from 2.5 million to 2.5 billion liters of milk per year. Now the project is supported by the Japanese Agricultural Mechanization Project re-established in 2013 at Namaliri Agricultural Station. The Assistant Commissioner Engineering and Mechanization Boniface Kanye says the ground has been cleared for pasture production to facilitate milk production. So that's how this project has. How do you call me at this time, honestly? That the government of Uganda, through the Minister of Agriculture, that they continue supporting this project because the project is even going now, other than only depending on uh, rain fed water to uh, harvest and uh, store, we're also going to bring in the drilling rigs. That will now, after we have constructed, when it is a drought period, we'll be able to go and drill the boreholes, the production wells, and we're able to recharge the water facilities that we have constructed. We have looked at the, once we have done the assessment of the, of the, of the farm, and looking at those factors of uh, availability of the land, free of encumbrances, uh, the, 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 the purpose of the, the infrastructure, looking yes. at the demand, yes. how many say, animals need to be watered, or if it's for pasture development, how many acres are supposed to be reclaimed so that the pasture can be uh, planted. Then we get back and do some est cost estimation. We develop a cost and then share it with the farmer because equipment is accessed on a cost sharing basis. There, of course, for Uganda's uh, milk industry having a boost there from just two point something million liters to two billion. Now, let's look at uh, cocoa farming in the country, and this is something that uh, most farmers actually are engaging, and it's uh, getting them some good income. And uh, we, we're going to look specifically at um, a man called Duma, who is a secondary school teacher at Kasawa in Mkono district. Now, he decided to start a cocoa farm to subsidize his income and sustain his family. But today, Duma has made a fortune in the agricultural project. Take a look. Uh, Innovation is the mother of success, so it's often said. Qualifying as a secondary school teacher did not stop Ismail Dumba from embracing farming as an alternative source of income. Though a teacher at Kasao Secondary School, Chigayaza, Dumba now owns a cocoa plantation from where he earns an average of one million shillings monthly. Dumba jangles between his teaching job and cocoa farming as a hobby, a situation that has made him busy and focused. Kokoa requires a shed and is therefore planted in banana plantations or bushy plants with sufficient canopy to protect it from withering during dry seasons. Farmers, however, have to leave enough space between the shed trees and cocoa plants for better yields. Cocoa matures in a period of two to three years of planting and is harvested every after two weeks throughout the year, though it has two major seasons where harvesting is intensive. Ismail Dumba intercrops his cocoa with other crops, which earns him additional money along the way. However, though he praises cocoa as one of the best crops to grow, there are some challenges that affect him from maximizing proceeds from the project mainly thieves, pests, wind and mold. 
being a crop that is only widely grown in Uganda, there are few buyers. Dumba says these buyers cheat them because of a limited market. Now Duma plans to expand his plantation and become a leading cocoa farmer in Uganda. He also aims at being a model teacher with cocoa as his other source of income. Cocoa is a high value crop with two main seasons, though harvesting can be throughout the year. A number of districts in Uganda with high humidity, mainly Bundibujo, Mayuge, Hoima, Kagadi, Chibale, Ntoroko, Kasese, Mukono, Kayunga, Buyikwe, and Impiji are into cocoa growing. Uganda earns about 350 bags of cocoa annually, fetching about $1.7 million and contributes about 2% to the total cocoa produced in Africa with Ivory Coast contributing over 8%. Other leading cocoa producing countries in Africa are Ivory Coast, Liberia, Ghana, Cameroon, Nigeria, DR Congo, and Togo. Mutonyi Hilda, UBC. Now let's have a look at how the shilling fare today against selected local and international currencies in our business report. Moving further afield, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin have called for a ceasefire to end the conflict in Libya. Now, the two leaders are seen to back rival sides in a conflict dragging in an increasing number of states. After talks in Istanbul, Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Putin said the ceasefire should come into force at midnight on Sunday. Now the call came amid a warning by German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas of a Syrian-style civil war in Libya. Last week, Turkey sent troops to the North African state to bolster the embattled UN-backed government. Turkey accuses Russia of having about 2,500 mercenaries in Libya to support the UN-backed administration's main rival, General Khalifar Haftar. Russia denies the allegation. Libya is strategically important, having the largest oil reserves in Africa. It is located along the Mediterranean coast and a gateway to Europe for African migrants. Previous efforts to end hostilities and unite the nation have failed, and it is unclear whether the latest initi initiative will succeed. Sports news now and we begin with uh, football and specifically looking at women football where 2020 looks to be a busy year for women football. The national under-17 women team faces Ethiopia in their World Cup qualifier game while the under-20 women team has equally entered residential camp. Gabo Amon reports. The Ethiopian women under-17 team are in the country ahead of the Saturday encounter with Uganda at the Star Time Stadium in Lugogo. The Ethiopian team arrived at 1 p.m. local time aboard Ethiopian Airways. The two teams will battle in the first leg of the Under-17 World Cup qualifier. So we have uh, 25 delegations 
for this match and we are ready for the match and we arrived here by this time. Uh, we hope uh, our team is preparing physically and mentally more than uh, 11 days in Addis in one hotel and they are preparing for this match. Their counterparts from Uganda have had a week's residential camp at the Njeru Technical Center preparing for the game and currently train at the Star Time Stadium in Mogogo. Uh, so far our training is so good as players. We are focused and motivated. On Saturday's game we need victory. On behalf of my team, so far, we shall win, on the, shall win on that game. Uganda won the inaugural under-17 Sekafa Women Championship and equally triumphed at the Kosafa Games where they had been invited as guest team in Mauritius. Meanwhile, the national under-20 women's football team arrived safely at Njeru Technical Center to prepare for the under-20 women World Cup qualifier first leg match against Tanzania on the 18th of January 2020 away in Dar es Salaam. We are starting training to, today, camp, camp. And we are waiting for, we only have two girls who have not recorded yet, one from Balala and the other one from Iganga. Sorry to sorry, we are waiting for them and we expect them to join us by today evening or tomorrow morning. We are ready for the camp, the girls are in good shape, attitude, the attitude is good. So pray for us. 30 players were summoned in camp including those featuring for the under-17 women team. The team is led by Olive Mbekeka as the head coach, assisted by former Crested Cranes captain Christine Wanyama. This will be the second time Uganda is taking part in the FIFA Under-20 Women World Cup qualifiers. And all the best to the Under-17 ladies team there. Now, amidst confusion of licensing players and tracing the rightful owners of Toro United FC, two league games have so far been played since the commencement of the second round of the 2019-2020 Uganda Premier League season. The KCCA defeated Imbarara City at Logogo, while Euro defeated Sports Club Villa. More league action has been lined up this Friday, with five games to be played at different venues. Vipers Sports Club is hosting Chetume FC at St. Mary's Stadium in Chitende as favourites not only to win the game but also contenders for the title. While in training, both teams showed optimism to put up a good show. Bristers, meanwhile, uh, is hosting Bull FC in the second game of the day with Bull proving to be contesting for the title. Busoga FC plays Express at the Mighty Arena in Jija. Maroons host Prolin while Wakisu Giants play Police FC. And of course, that was the sports news, and of course, mouth watering encounters there towards the weekend, especially on Friday. Let's have a look now at the weather prospects for tomorrow with uh, Kavasita Daphne and Samba at the Weather Center in Entebbe. Thanks for watching UBC. Now let's go through the weather update from Uganda National Meteorological Authority. I'm Daphne Kavasita Ansamba. Most parts of the country had a sunny conditions, especially the northern part of Uganda. But then in the southern, we had a scattered showers with cloudy conditions. According to a report that received today, Kabad reported the highest amount of rainfall of 9.2 millimeters, and then Toro we had 3.3 millimeters, and then Bududa we had 2.5 millimeters. Checking on the satellite image of Africa, it shows that we are getting winds from the northern part of Africa, causing the dry and sunny conditions that we are having in most parts of Uganda. But then we are benefiting from winds that are coming from Congo towards the western part of Uganda. That's why the southwestern part of Uganda is having cloudy conditions with scattered showers though we are expecting a reduction in the next uh, three days for tomorrow we are expecting sunny intervals in most parts of Uganda apart from the western part of Lake Victoria where we are expecting scattered showers late in the afternoon we are expecting uh, scattered showers in the southwestern part of Uganda but then other parts of Uganda we are expecting sunny intervals temperatures are expected to rise to 32 degrees Celsius in the northern part of Uganda and then in our capital city we're expecting temperatures to rise to 28 in Kabale we're expecting temperatures to rise to 20
three. Going beyond Uganda, we expect in Nairobi, Amsterdam, Paris to have uh, showers, and then in Chigali, we expecting thunder showers. In uh, Dubai, we expecting cloudy conditions with temperatures rising to 28. That's what we had in our store. Continue tuning into UBC. Have a blessed evening. Blessed evening to you too, Kawasita there. Now let's have a look at our top stories. In our news tonight, President Yori Museveni to build a culture of walking as a therapy for physical fitness. KCCA Council meeting flops over absence of technical team. Libya conflict, Turkey and Russia call for ceasefire. And in sports, the under-17 women, Ethiopian women team arrives for Saturday game. It's coming to 8 minutes to 11 p.m. in the studios of UBC TV. Thank you so much for having kept us company. Mugalu Mohammed has been on sign language and I am Edward Rukidi Kijanangoma. Wishing you a blessed night. See you some other time. Was brought to you by UCC. Celebrating 20 years of achievements.